ahead of your paper two and paper three, you really need to know how to use your calculators and not just your phone calculator, specifically your scientific calculator. If you haven't already grabbed one, which hopefully you obviously have, if you haven't got one, I will have a link in my description for one from Amazon. I'm assuming you can also buy one from the school, maybe it's cheaper there. If you can just borrow one from an older sibling, an older cousin, someone, if you can get a second hand one, that's also fine. Just make sure that you have the correct scientific calculator. And then when you're doing your revision or your past papers, you're using that specific calculator. So we're gonna be going through 10 different tips and tricks that I have that I think are worth knowing for when you go into your calculator exams. So I've got a series of questions here that we can use to demonstrate these tricks. The first one is, I like to use my calculator to help me simplify ratios, if that happens to be the question. Normally it's like at the end of a whole question. So at the end of a whole question, you might have obviously a bigger ratio that you need to simplify. The way that I personally do it is that I just chuck those two digits into a fraction format. So just one over the other. Ideally put the bigger one in the denominator if you can. Because think about it, fractions and ratios simplify in the same way. You just have either both numbers on top of each other or both numbers next to each other. So just chuck it into a fraction, press equals, it will simplify it as a fraction for you. And then obviously just make sure that you re-put those numbers on the correct side of your ratio. Simple as that. Another tip is knowing how to convert from improper fractions into mixed numbers and vice versa. So just type in either your mixed number or your improper fraction into your calculator. You can press equals, it might give you the same answer. If you then want to figure out the conversion, just simply press, instead of just the SD button, but shift SD, and that will convert it into the opposite of what you've got. Now, also, if you want to convert it into a decimal, just press the SD button straight as it is. So if you ever get a speed distance time question and at the end they're asking you to give the time, they might have given it to you originally in terms of just hours and then they've asked you to put your answer in hours and minutes. So you would type in the number of hours as a decimal, obviously press equals, once you've got the answer which will be the same thing, if you can find the button that kind of looks like almost like a full stop and then three commas, just press that on top of your answer and it will convert it into hours and minutes for you. If you've not yet been asked about product of prime factors in paper one, then there's still a good chance it could come up in paper two or paper three. So how do we break down any numbers into the product of their prime factors? You will again want to just type that number in, press equals, and then on your calculator find the fact button. You might have to press shift and then fact, but just find where it is where it says fact. You will see it will break it down into the product of its prime factors. That might just be the whole question, or it might be to then use it in highest common factor lowest common multiple and it can help you from there. Hopefully as you know if you're going to be using percentages in your calculator you actually have to convert them into decimals. Whether you're just comfortable with dividing by 100 that's fine I would probably just type it in directly or if you're not you can always use a percentage button in your calculator and it will convert any percentage into the decimal. So just type in your whole calculation and then find on your calculator the percentage button. Mine again I will have to press shift to find it you may or may not have to do that. It will then just automatically convert it into a decimal for you and obviously then correctly do the calculation. Number six, I think is a really great tip that I definitely didn't know when I was doing GCSEs, is you can actually find all of the coordinates in an XY table for your graph on the calculator. I find this particularly helpful because A, it saves time so you don't have to manually substitute in every single X value, but also a lot of the time there are negative X values and you have to square it or there's just a mixture of negatives and positives and sometimes the calculator will get it wrong. When you use this function, you're avoiding that problem completely. So it does depend on what your calculator is. Different calculators access this in a different way. You might have to choose mode or maybe menu or something like that at the top of your calculator. On mine, it's called mode. And then I choose the number that gives me the option for table. Yours might also be different. I'm then shown something like f of x. You might also see g of x if yours is a newer version. f of x, hopefully you know this already, just basically means y, doesn't it? y equals f of x equals. So then you would type in whatever equation you have of the graph. So just make sure you know where the X is on your calculator as well. Obviously just apply squares, add, subtract, all of that as normal and type in the whole equation. Once you've got the whole equation, it might bring you onto a different screen if you press equals. Normally it will ask you something like start, end and step. Some synonym of that. The start is the start of your table in terms of the x value. So look at the table they've given you in the question. So for this example, it's negative three. That's my starting value. So I'm gonna input negative three. Then my end is then obviously the opposite side of the table, which in this case is positive three. And my step just means 
what is the difference between each of the columns. If you press equals again, it will create a table. Now it will display it vertically instead of horizontally, but if you have a look on the left, you should have X. So those are obviously your X coordinates, which are already in the table. And on the right, you have F of X, which as I said, represents the Y coordinates. Those are the ones you're going to put into your table. It's a lot easier because then it's all just done in one step and you don't have to keep substituting in and risking making errors. As you can see, now I can just plot my graph really easily and really accurately. Once you've created your table, you might need to try and exit out of that. So I just press the same button as before, which for me was mode, it might be menu for you. And then I choose whatever number one is, the normal one, it will bring you back out of the table function. My next tip is to do a standard form. I think this only really works if you've got a positive power. I guess it depends on the calculator. From my experience, it only works if you have positive power, but it will let you convert from standard form into the ordinary number. So all you have to do is type in, so let's say for this example, type in the 4.5, then you should find on your calculator a button that says times 10 to the power of X. You click that, and then you just literally type in whatever the power is, not as a power, just literally type it in as a number. So this one's obviously five, and you see how that's converted it into the ordinary number for me. If we do the other example, 1.452, press my button times 10, and that one's to the power of three. And as you can see, again, it's converted it into an ordinary number. One of the buttons that I think is the most useful on the calculator is the answer button, the ANS button. It's the one where it copies your previous answer with all of the decimals, so you don't get any rounding errors. Sometimes you might have a really long question, a five or a six marker, and there are lots and lots of decimals and you don't really want to round your answer until right at the end. Obviously, I try to use my answer button as much as possible, keep my previous answer in my calculator. When I do my new calculation, I'll just input ANS so that I can avoid rounding anything until right at the end of my question. However, sometimes you have so many different numbers you're juggling that you just need to kind of store one for a second, do another calculation and then come back to it. In this case, we can store numbers in our calculator as well, not just in the answer button. The answer button will only store your previous calculation answer. So that can get a little bit tricky. So if you want to store a number in your calculator, obviously do whatever your calculation was, get your answer there. So let's say I've worked out the radius in this really long cone question. As you can see, it's got loads of decimals and I don't want to round them too soon because I'm going to be inputting this multiple times in the rest of my question. So I've got my answer here. I'm going to press shift and then find a button that says STO. STO as in storage. Press that and then just choose, do you see all of your letters here? I've got A, B, C, D, E, F, and so on. The pink letters on mine, I don't know if they're a different color on yours. Just choose one of those buttons to store it under. So let's say A. Do you see how now it says my answer has gone to A? So now when I want to work out the next phase in this question, I can just use the button A. So obviously I'm gonna press, in my case, alpha to get to the A. Yours might be different, just figure out how you can get to that A and the rest of my calculation. And there you can see it's given me another answer. Again, I've not cut off or rounded any of those decimals too soon. The other use is then with iteration. It makes it a lot easier if you have an iteration question because we are given a formula and normally you're asked to find out three values by inputting your previous answer into that formula three times. So the way you can set up your calculator to do iteration is double check what the starting number is. In this case, do you see how it says start with x, zero is two. So two is my starting number. I will put two in my calculator as it is, press equals. Now it's in my answer memory, isn't it? Then I will get rid of that and I will type in the whole equation, whatever the equation is depending on your question. So in this case, I've got the cube root of 10 minus two. Now where it says x, I'm gonna put my answer button. That's my whole formula. So now if I press equals once, that's my value for x, one. 1. 1.817 dot, 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 dot. Then I press equals again. That's my next value, 1.8533. And I don't have to therefore type in all of those decimals every time. Obviously do it one more time, 1.846 dot, 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 dot. So that's how you can use the answer button for iteration. Finally, just a little tip when you are solving quadratic equations, if you choose or if you need to, use the quadratic formula. Sometimes when you use the quadratic formula, you might end up with an error message on your calculator and it doesn't give you an answer. And I just want you to know how to unpick that if it does happen to you. What is actually the problem? Why is there an error? Well, sometimes calculators get really mixed up, again, as I mentioned before, with negative numbers and particularly with squaring negative numbers. See the square root section on your quadratic formula. That's normally where the issue has arisen. So the problem is that inside your square root symbol, the calculator has calculated it to be a negative answer. 
Now, if you remember, you can't square root a negative answer, a negative number, that's impossible. You cannot square root a negative number. Hence why your calculator has gone error. So you just need to go back. Sometimes with a quadratic formula, I just work out pieces myself. For example, for the b squared, if you have a negative b and then you square it, sometimes the calculator will leave that as a negative, which is not true. If you square any number, negative or positive, it becomes positive. So sometimes I'll just input it as positive in the first place because I know that that's what's going to happen. And then the same thing, you've then got minus 4 times a times c. If a or c are also negative, the minus 4 and the other value are going to cancel out in terms of negatives. So sometimes I just make that positive. Either way, if you find that you've got an error using quadratic formula, just go back and double check the part with the square root, what's inside there, what has gone wrong in terms of positives and negatives. So those are my top 10 tips and tricks for using your calculator. As I said, please, please, please make sure you get used to your calculator, that you know it like the back of your hand. It will really help you in your paper two and paper three exams.